Hello, listeners. Welcome to this new episode of my podcast, A Digital Tomorrow. I'm joined today by King Leung, head of fintech at Invest Hong Kong. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to host uh, King. So thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Well, it's a great pleasure. So thanks for the invitation. Well, the pleasure is absolutely uh, mine. And I'm, I need to say that I'm very happy to be hosting uh, King because as most of you listeners will know, I have a special relationship with uh, Hong Kong. So to be able to speak with King, I'm sure it's going to be very interesting, not just for me, but uh, for all uh, of you. Uh, I think we should start like uh, from, from the very beginning. And I wanted to ask you, King, um, if you could please share with uh, my listeners a bit more about, uh, well, first of all, about yourself, if you want, of course, but then also about Invest uh, Hong Kong. What is Invest Hong Kong and uh, what do you do? Well, uh, I think a good way to start is to uh, start with uh, a quote that I really enjoyed. And this is actually one of my one-time, all-time uh, favorite quotes from this movie called uh, Jerry Maguire. So I think, uh, I don't know whether your listeners are uh, of a rich uh, age group, but then this is a movie has been around for, gosh, has been, must be like 10 years or older. But uh, uh, Tom Cruise, he played the main character in the movie. He's a sports uh, agent that he represents a lot of his athletes. And the one line that he made in the movie was, show me the money. Okay, so so essentially, I think this is a good way for us to think about uh, how we can how we meaning you know Hong Kong can contribute uh, to the ecosystem by helping companies to get access to clients, get access to investors, and so on. So really about showing the money. Now and perhaps uh, before I talk a bit more about exactly what we do, uh, I would like to use maybe like a minute to talk about my background. And then by then, I think it would make a lot of sense in terms of the approach that we are taking. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, uh, I am, uh, uh, I, well, I was an engineer by, by training and education. So I did the 3D printing design uh, like years ago, like decades ago. So back in the days uh, when it was still a novelty. But since then, I moved on to do uh, consulting from technology consulting to operations consulting to strategy consulting. And also I did a little bit of venture capital. So all in the US and UK. And before I came back to Asia, and back in the days, uh, we're talking about uh, the early 2000s, in which uh, it was just after the dot-com burst, uh, in which I got to, to see the, all these dot-com developments up close and personal from a consultant standpoint, as well as from a investor standpoint. And since and because of that experience, I came back to Asia to raise some seed capital from Credit Suisse to start a big data company uh, in the early 2000s. And since then, it has, it has evolved to uh, other businesses. So in a stretch of, let's say, 15 years or so, I have uh, started uh, three different startups uh, in data, in uh, uh, modern automation, and the CRM space. So along the way, I also served uh, quite a lot of uh, financial institutions, including Credit Suisse, uh, but also other insurance companies from the the AIG, the AXA from France, and a number of other insurance and financial institutions. So because of that background, I also got the taste of uh, what FinTech and InvestTech was like. Uh, and, and then I, I thought, well, perhaps I should try it out my hand uh, to uh, get into angel investment. Because I also felt that after being a, a startup founder uh, a few times, I'd like to be on the other side of the table. So I did that for another two years. And, and then after that, I went to also teach FinTech in mainland China, uh, essentially mm -hmm. with the goal of broadening my horizon. Uh, and, by, and by then I was like, wow, gosh, I've done, I've done a lot of things. But if I were to, I would say, elevate my horizon again, so what would be a good position to be in <coughs> so that I can even learn more? Because I am somebody who would like to, I'm very adventurous. I like to learn a lot of things. I like to contribute and then share my knowledge and experience. And then this opportunity from US Hong Kong came along. So, so here I am and the rest is history. So, so far because of that prior background of being a prior consultant slash you know, startup founder slash investor as angel and VC and also as an academia. So I was able to offer a pretty holistic view uh, when I work with the uh, startups from around the world 
and offer them the advice to help them to get into the Hong Kong market and using Hong Kong as a springboard to expand to other regional markets as well. Mm -hmm. Now, so, so that's that's kind of my, my background. Now, so um, I don't want to bore your bore your audience. Uh, it's maybe it's just two know. lines. So the Invest Hong Kong limit uh, for the fintech team is very simple. So first, uh, we are the uh, investment promotion agency of the Hong Kong government. So therefore, our job is to attract foreign direct investments. So therefore, our KPIs will be to attract uh, overseas companies to sell in Hong Kong, invest some uh, money in Hong Kong, as well as hiring the, some local talents. Uh, but the second limit is that because we also received the budget from the policy bureau, uh, we call FSDB, the Financial Services and Treasury Bureau. So that is the policy bureau responsible for everything related to financial services. And because of that relationship, we are also asked to do basically everything in our power to help foster fintech development across Hong Kong. It can be helping to connect companies with potential clients, uh, with investors. It can be to get access to talent from a hiring standpoint. It can be to talk with the regulators, understand how to apply for licenses, and so on. So perhaps I'll just uh, pause here as we can, uh, I'm sure that we can get into a bit more detailed uh, as we go further in this conversation. Well, uh, don't worry, King, uh, you're not worrying my audience. Everything you said is very uh, interesting. And I wanted to ask you now, um, I mean, you said what are uh, Invest Hong Kong's main functions. And I wanted to ask you now about, um, well, about Hong Kong in general. Why Hong Kong? Why should any foreign company choose Hong Kong? And I know it may seem like a very broad question, but I know that Hong Kong has been long seen as the gateway to China, but to me, it's much more than that right now. I mean, Hong Kong is part of the GBA. Hong Kong per se is one of the world's most important financial centers. So taking all that into consideration, why should any foreign company choose Hong Kong and especially any foreign fintech company? Well, the, uh, I, I can go on and on, uh, but then I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll just highlight uh, three things. Now, first, we will look at uh, a and &E startups, fintechs, and also other sectors. The number one most important factor for a founder to consider a market is the market, uh, because I've been there like three times. So naturally, when you think about fintech, uh, based on our study of the unicorns, as well as our own internal statistics uh, of the companies already landed, uh, fintech companies already landed in Hong Kong, roughly speaking, we're talking about for every 100 fintechs in the market, Two thirds are engaging in B two B business. One one third is B two C. Now, so if you are B two B, then the, who are your customers? Well, those are the typically the financial institutions, the banks, the insurance companies, the uh, the brokers, right? And sometimes the large corporates. So so then you ask yourself the next question. So where can we? If you have to go to a a market, of course by market I'm not, I'm not talking about a country. So a country like, let's say the US is huge, right? So being in New York and in Texas, Austin versus in Silicon Valley means different things. So in a way, when we think about market, you sometimes have to think about the, the city that you're gonna set up uh, to be the hub, right? Now then the next logical question is, so if I have to set up, where, where do I go? Then you naturally would go to the ranks, the ranking of the global international financial centers. Because this is where the money is, the liquidity, the concentration of financial institutions, and so forth. Of course, by almost any measure, right? New York City is the number one for many, many years. And then number two, London. But number three, a close number three is actually Hong Kong. In fact, I think the, the, the gap between London and Hong Kong has been shrinking quite a lot, uh, unfortunately, since, since the Brexit. So because of that reason, then naturally for almost majority of the FinTech uh, founders, it's almost a no brainer for them to consider Hong Kong because of that reason, because this is where the market is. Now, so the number is market. Now, secondly, it's about capital. So it can be the early stage, it can be the later stage, the pre-IPO. Of course, I think for a lot of the, let's say US based firms, then they would choose, of course, listing in US. But for almost for a lot of other firms, particularly now, a lot of the momentum and the, and the, the fintech activities are now shifting to uh, Asia. Now in Asia, then you, then you ask yourself the next question, where is the, the biggest 
uh, IPO market in Asia. Well, if you just go through the a lot, the, the Google search and so on, you will find that Hong Kong has been uh, one of the major IPO destinations in like seven of the past 12 years. Hong Kong was ranked number one in the world, not just Asia. So naturally, if, particularly for companies that have the, uh, the scale that they like to be, let, let, let's just say that they are like two years away from uh, IPO, then they would like to use Hong Kong as a, as a springboard, do another round, a pre-IPO round, and then work with Hong Kong Exchange to get listed in Hong Kong. Now, even for the early stage, you know, for the, the VC funding and so forth, uh, Hong Kong is actually the second largest private capital pool in Asia, just behind mainland China. So we account for like 14% of all the private capital available. Now, this is the second capital. And the third is about the, the, the regulatory environments. Because when we think about uh, fintechs, oftentimes, uh, they, particularly if they are facing the end customers, they need to get a license. Now, then you have to ask a question, uh, yourself the question, where do you want to get the license in which it means something in the, in the national market? So um, again, I'm not uh, going to name names, but there are other really small island countries that are offering a different kind of uh, licenses. Mm -hmm. Now again, um, it's getting a lot, a lot of traction, don't get me wrong. But just that when you think about expanding to some larger markets, now whether or not getting a license from a small island country would give you the credibility as a fintech company or digital asset company, crypto company, the answer is probably not. You may you would want to go to a uh, a, a market that's known for the the rigor, the rigor behind finan financial regulations. So then it goes back to the first point. Then so you go to, of course, the New York, the London, the Hong Kong, and those licenses mean a lot. Uh, so that's the other bit, and, and plus the regulators in Hong Kong are very progressive minded. That they're constantly launching new regulations uh, to basically to be more in line the pace of innovation in the market. Now, so again, I can go on and on. Perhaps I'll just pause here. We can have a further discussion. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing those uh, reasons. Um, now you, you thought about, you talked about um, regulations in Hong Kong and how progressive uh, regulations wise uh, you are, no, in all those areas of FinTech. And this brought to my mind uh, the recently held uh, Hong Kong uh, FinTech Week, which took place in, in early November. and in which I was um, lucky enough to participate as a speaker. And well, it brought to my mind the, the announcement made by the HSTV you know, regarding the regulations of virtual assets in Hong Kong. And I wanted to ask you, like, not, not so much specifically about these regulations, but in general, about Hong Kong's uh, fintech scene, the fintech industry. Uh, like, um, why is it strong? What makes Hong Kong's fintech scene strong? And then how you foresee it will evolve these coming years? Well, uh, since you talk about the fintech week, maybe I'll start. I'll start there yeah. as a way to sort of, as a lead in. Now, at the uh, the fintech week, uh, two thousand twenty two, uh, that was held on the thirty first of October to the first of November. Uh, on the first day, uh, it was a <laughs> an enormous day because uh, uh, several of the most senior government and regulator officials they came out in unison. In announcing the Hong Kong virtual asset uh, policy announcement. That is essentially in favor of the further development of the regulatory regime and also of the policy to promote digital asset developments. Now, and of course, I think around the world, there have been quite a lot of uh, uh, ner nervousness, particularly with, of course, you know, the FTX and mm -hmm. the Three Arrows, the Luna. I mean, that, that uh, unfortunately, a lot of people got hurt. Now, but then it's actually the exact same reason uh, why Hong Kong has been uh, so steadfast in sticking to our principle. Now, of course, I think for a lot of our friends and, and, and colleagues and stakeholders around the world, uh, I think you may not be very familiar with the regulatory environment in Hong Kong. But Hong Kong is very much a rule-based, like a uh, rule of law. It's very much a bedrock of Hong Kong. So even for regulation, uh, the, the regulators don't like to make a lot of discretions. They like to make it as clear as possible, just rule based, so that they're not going to say, "Oh, you know, this year we 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 we're in favor of, let's say, retail crypto firms. Why don't you come in, give you a, a kind, all kind of policy support and all that?" And next year's, "Oh, whoops! By the way, 
uh, we are not welcoming VTAC anymore. So just uh, so so uh, we treating. So so we try not to do that. We try to make it as consistent as possible without a lot of flip flopping. So therefore, uh, in, in many ways, when we launch a regulatory regime, sometimes that may take a bit longer than some other jurisdictions. But once we've decided to do it, we will stick to our gun and, 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 go, and go for it. And so that kind of regulatory consistency and clarity is something that is super important, particularly for the sort of fast moving space like digital assets, which is changing very quickly. So for someone to, to, to decide to invest into a market, typically it's like at least, right, like a three to five years horizon. So if there's a lot of, so I'll say, flip-flopping, it's very difficult to plan. So this is one thing that I just want to highlight, which is something that had gained, gotten a lot of attention uh, at the uh, FinTech Week during that policy announcement. No, I think that um, uh, what you mentioned now about uh, regulatory clarity and consistency, that's actually, uh, that's key, you know, that's basic. And I know it very well because I initially studied law. I used to work as a lawyer before, so that's why and you know that companies, they tend to go wherever they know there is a certainty. I mean, you don't want to, to get established in a place where you know that the rules may change like tomorrow or even today, you know. And especially, as you said now, in, in areas like uh, digital assets, uh, where things tend to change so fast, you need this kind of clarity coming from the, the regulators. And so I think that Hong Kong's moves in those areas lately have been very, all very interesting and I'm sure they will benefit Hong Kong uh, even uh, more. And I think before we then end to discuss you know, a bit about um, Hong Kong's fintech scene in the sense that, um, well, um, I mean, we all know it's very strong, but um, how do you foresee it will evolve these uh, coming years? Uh, Hong Kong, for example, was a pioneer in the introduction of uh, virtual banks in, in Asia. You know, I mean, eight were, were started to operate uh, more than two years ago. You know? So how do you foresee the fintech industry in Hong Kong will evolve? Like uh, what areas? Will Hong Kong put its focus on? Will it be digital assets? Will it be more about, I don't know, virtual banking, AI? Right. Well, this is a, <clears throat> a great question. And uh, again, it's also a very big question. So let me try to dissect it in, uh, it's almost like peeling onions. Let me try to dissect it in three different uh, layers. Now, the first layer is the macro layer. Now, and by red macro, I'm referring to things like CBDC because I, I know that you have been writing a lot about this topic. So you are mm -hmm. definitely an expert on this. Now, but in the interest for the, uh, the broader audience of yours, now for CBDC, the, the central bank digital currency has been capturing a lot of media attention in the past few years. Now, but then if you go by, for example, this report uh, published by PwC, it was I think over a year ago, that they were uh, essentially benchmarking the, uh, the readiness to go live, to roll out CBDC, uh, on the both wholesale and the retail level across uh, you know, a lot of the jurisdictions around the world. Now, and for wholesale, actually Hong Kong and Thailand were ranked co number one by PwC as the most advanced and most ready to roll out commercially. Okay, now, and, and there's a reason for that. And that's because uh, in mainland China, uh, they've been uh, testing the CBDC almost are the head of everybody else on the planet. And of course, uh, uh, CBDC uh, you know, refers to currency and RMB at the moment is not completely uh, convertible as a currency. So that's why the Hong Kong still has a role to play in terms of being that international conduit well, with the rest of the world. So therefore, a pilot uh, were uh, conducted, I think it was like a year to uh, 18 months ago, in which the, a few central banks, so PBOC, People Banks of China, the Hong Kong de facto central bank, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Bank of Thailand, the Central Bank of Thailand, and also the Central Bank from UAE. And then the sort of like super project manager, if you will, is DIS, the Bank of International Settlements, uh, the Innovation Center, also uh, uh, in Hong Kong. So they work on this project called MCBDC. Now, without getting into a lot of details, this is about testing out the technical feasibility of uh, essentially transferring digital money across the different markets. So that was done. So that was tested. So it was uh, over a year ago. So now, so that was like 2021. 2022, last year, actually, uh, actually MA and Invest Hong Kong, our team, 
launched this uh, comp competition called the CBDC uh, Fast Track. Essentially, it's like a crowdsourcing of ideas about the commercial use cases of CBDC in different uh, dimensions. So again, uh, maybe I'm, going, I'm getting too much detailed. So the point I'm trying to make is that at the macro level, Hong Kong is very much at the forefront in, in, in basically testing out and um, in a way creating that innovation of commercial use cases to push through a lot of this new innovation such as uh, CBDC. So that's the first layer. Now, next layer down. Now, we, we also look at FinTech, not just about FinTech, but as, as a enabler for enhancing the competitiveness of the entire financial services in, uh, industry. So that's why when you go by the HMA, again, the de facto central bank and also the banking regulator in Hong Kong, they have launched this strategy called strategy 2021, oh, sorry, 2025, but FinTech strategy 2025. So in that roadmap, the first of the five objectives is all banks go FinTech. So that means that all the banks, whether uh, it's uh, from the uh, the own uh, need from a commercial standpoint or from the risk management compliance standpoint, the, the bank regulator HMA has been encouraging the banks to be the leaders in the whole financial services industry to adopt more FinTech uh, solutions and technologies. It can be RegTech, regulatory technology, it can be um, uh, even the payment tech uh, to enhance the, the cross-border payments efficiency. It can be wealth tech in the form, form of uh, robot advisory and so on. So, so that has really gained a lot of traction. So one of the figures released by HMA was that, that over 86% of all the banks uh, surveyed uh, by HMA in Hong Kong have already adopted fintechs. So that's why the, this is the second layer, which is FinTech as a layer enabler to upgrade the capabilities and com competitiveness of the FIs. Now, and then the third layer is really about the layer of innovation. So the startup scene, if you will. So naturally, when we think about the startup scene, again, we have the Hong Kong Fintech Week, we have the uh, Start Me Up Festival in which they also promote uh, FinTech. We work very closely with Alibaba, Entrepreneurs Fund in the Jump Starter program. They are one of the major pillars. In fact, the biggest pillar of that program is uh, FinTech. So the point, the reason why I mentioned about all these like really large scale events is because this is one of the many things that we have done to in a way foster the startups uh, ecosystem so that we are able to promote more innovation uh, for the smaller FinTech companies. But this is what, this is where a lot of times where the true innovation comes from. So again, I can go on and on. For example, we launched this program called Global Fast Track that we are attracting the FinTech companies around the world to join the competition with the end goal of con con uh, basically connecting them with potential clients and investors. We also recently launched a portal, which we call the FinTech HK Community Platform, which is an online website uh, where the companies even from Spain or anywhere else in the world can sign up so that they can be more easily discovered by the buyers of fintech solutions, i.e. the financial institutions in Hong Kong. So again, we have so many initiatives with the aim of promoting a more vibrant fintech ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing. I, I think you mentioned like many interesting topics. Uh, you talked about CBDCs, which is a huge area of interest for me, of course. And I think that Hong Kong is doing remarkably well in that sense because I mean, you were talking as well about the HKMA, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Hong Kong's de facto central bank. And it's interesting because it's not common to see a central bank involved in so many CBDC projects in parallel, you know, because the HKMA has been testing the digital yuan for cross-border payments, that's one, plus MCBDC bridge, as you said, plus the electronic Hong Kong dollar, you know, et cetera. So being involved in, in so many projects at the same time is actually something quite uh, unique. You know, not many jurisdictions, central banks have this, um, this role right now, even in the CBDC era that we are entering. You mentioned as well uh, FinTech uh, 2025, which I think is a very interesting uh, roadmap. I actually wrote a lot about that when it was unveiled. I think it was in July last year, July, two, no, July 2021, like one year and a half ago. And I think this is actually a document that I highly encourage my listeners to read. 
even though they are not based in Hong Kong, even if they don't know much about Hong Kong, I think we need to read that because it's a clear attempt no, by, by, by regulators and by all the industry in Hong Kong to, to encourage digitalization, no, to encourage banks to become more digital. And I think it's remarkable to see that in one of the world's most important uh, financial uh, centers. And before wrapping up, I wanted to ask you a very uh, brief question. I, I know you talk now about the Hong Kong FinTech Week, but I wanted to ask you a bit more about it. So um, why is it important for a place like Hong Kong to organize an event like this? Or in other words, uh, given Hong Kong's strong FinTech scene, what would it change if Hong Kong didn't organize and participate in these large scale events? Well, um, the, the short answer is uh, we are human beings, right? So we like, we are essentially like communal, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> creatures. So people like to get together, right, by nature. And uh, of course, the past few years, we have seen a lot of uh, things being done online. I guess to to a certain extent, we create success. Uh, but then you will you will ask almost anybody, right, whether whether that they are in Europe or in US or in Asia, they will tell you that they miss physical events. But this is where they can interact, and this is where like business deals happen. Now, and we we recognize that. So yes, you say so old fashioned way of doing events, but it works. Now, and and why we would do the fintech week, and that's because in many ways. Um, we need a uh, platform, a platform where the biggest ideas or the best ideas has a platform to, to make known to the world. Now, so therefore, um, for example, at the FinTech Week last year in November, uh, actually October and October and early November, uh, we actually have made so many announcements. This basically has become this like annual ritual, annual events for everybody in the ecosystem. If there's something important to say, typically they will make the announcement, they wait and make the announcement at the FinTech Week. But this is like the biggest forum, not just Hong Kong, but you can argue of the of, of Asia at the very least. So, so that's why the, this is such an amazing event to have this like big bang of new developments uh, announced all in one go. Now, and just to give you an idea, so we have tracked the uh, number of uh, media coverages. Now, of course, we, we didn't have access to events of other places, but then when we look at uh, the Hong Kong Fintech Week last year, we had tracked uh, in the first month uh, after the events. So let's say uh, over a span of four weeks at the event and also counting forward for another four weeks, we have tracked almost 2000 media coverages of the Fintech Week of various announcements. It can be the virtual assets, uh, policy announcements. It can be some major, you know, like a business joint venture that was announced new product launches and so forth. So for example, then another announcement made was a collaboration between uh, Invest Hong Kong and also the, um, in, uh, a project called 10, 10 times 1000. So that's a project uh, basically collaborated between ENS Group and also the IFC of World Bank. And uh, the project is about training uh, 1000 FinTech leaders uh, per year over 10 years. It's very much like a talent uh, development uh, international initiative. So Invest Hong Kong felt that this is such a, a great initiative that we decided to partner with uh, 10 times 1,000 together with ENS Bank, uh, ENS, ENS Group, and also IFC on World Bank. So that's, that was also an announcement being uh, made at the FinTech Week. So, so then again, because of that kind of high volume in, of important messages, we, we naturally were able to attract a lot of media attention. So for example, even myself, I was interviewed by Bloomberg, so do uh, several other major leaders in Hong Kong. So, so this is really a great way uh, to get a message out. Of course, as like you know, tens of thousands of people came together, this is all also where they can talk about deals, talk about investments and so on. Yeah. So again, it's a, it's a great platform that uh, uh, we're just doing like better and better and better. So just to give you a sense, last year we got like like thirty thousand visitors, like physical visitors, mm -hmm. and then we have all more than five million on online viewers. So that's enormous. That, that's a lot. That's a lot. And I, I, like, I can vouch for what you said now because I'm just for participating in the event as a speaker, no, I mean, which is much less than you did because you organized the event. No, I just participated as speaker. I got lots of media requests to participate. 
in their podcasts or to, to, to cite me in articles they were writing about uh, regulating virtual assets or digital yuan. So I can definitely tell there is like a lot going on in there. No? I mean, I can see like many media are interested in the event, in the speakers, and it's a huge exposure for Hong Kong, uh, definitely. And well, uh, I think, uh, I mean, we're running out of time. So I would like to thank you, King, for, for your time. It's been an honor to be able to speak with you about uh, Hong Kong, Invest Hong Kong. And I think this uh, coming year, 2023, is going to be exciting for Hong Kong because uh, we are finally seeing like all the restrictions being removed. Mainland China is reopening as well. So it's going to be like a new fresh start you know, after the pandemic for the fall of Hong Kong, Macau and China. And, and I think it's going to be something very exciting to see. Great. Yeah, so again, uh, th thanks for ha ha having me. And uh, it's a great way to reach out to uh, some audience from, from Spain and also uh, in Europe and other parts of the world. So I hope that the sharing can be useful to you. And if you have any questions, I'm very, I, I can be easily found on LinkedIn. It's just King Leung in Hong Kong. So ping me on, on LinkedIn. I'm happy to share uh, more graph information to you. I'm sure, I'm sure many people will reach out to, to you, King, and thanks again for, for participating in my podcast. And well, to all my listeners, uh, thank you very much for listening to this episode, which I hope you found uh, as interesting as I did. And please stay tuned for the next episodes. Thank you very much and see you soon.